Hey everyone, this is Stephen James from Project Life Mastery. Today I'm being joined by my good friend, John Lee Dumas. He's the founder of the Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast, the award-winning podcast where he's interviewed over 3,000 successful entrepreneurs. And he's also the author of a new book called The Common Path to Uncommon Success. And that's what we're going to be diving into today. We're going to be talking about success. What does it take to become successful? What are the core ingredients that you need to know to become successful that all entrepreneurs have in common. So John, welcome to the show. Stephen, the last time we hung out in person, we were both in Fiji in our swim trunks. So yeah. it's great to get back in the uh, same space-time continuum. Thanks for the invite. Awesome. Well, I want to hear about your story, brother. I, I, I don't even know your story about how you got into this world of internet marketing, building the podcast, Entrepreneurs on Fire. Do you mind sharing with people a little bit about yourself and how you got started with this to where you are today? Cool. I'll be very concise. Um, I was born and raised in a very small town in Southern Maine and, you know, had a great, you know, zero to 18 years of my life. Very traditional. Went to college on an army scholarship. So post-college, I spent eight years as an officer in the U.S. Army, four active, four in the reserves uh, years wise. Did a little 13 month tour of duty in Iraq as a uh, tank platoon commander. So I was in charge of four tanks, 16 men um, in a time of war. So pretty intense for sure um, for a 23 year old, you know, who had just spent the last four years, you know, focusing on beer and girls. And now I'm like, okay, now I've, I'm in war. Okay. Let's, let's shift the focus a little bit here. Then after my time in the army, I was like, okay, what's next? Like I've like, you know, I, high school, college, army officer, let's go to law school. So I tried law school thinking that was the next logical location. And it was miserable. Like I hated it from day one. I ended up dropping out after the first semester, just miserable as a law school student. I took off for a little uh, eat, pray, love scenario. I went to India for four months, spent four months living in Guatemala, Nepal, like just traveling the world, backpacking and you know, kind of trying to quote unquote, find myself. And when it came back, I thought I was ready to get serious. So I tried corporate finance uh, with John Hancock in Boston. And that lasted about a year before I quit. And then I tried uh, real estate for a while, both residential and commercial and, you know, had some fun and some success there. But overall, my 26 to 32 year range was what I call actually the six years of struggle. Cause like all that was happening during those six years. And Frankly, I wasn't finding really any success, wasn't finding any happiness, and I didn't really know like what I was doing with my life. I felt like I was floating for those six, uh, six years. And it was really at 32 years old that I kind of started my online internet marketing uh, journey where I just started reading the right books. So it started with like a think and grow rich, you know, continued to move that forward to more modern day books like the four hour work week, excuse me. And then I was like, listening to audiobooks at a high quantity. And then I started listening to podcasts because I'm like, oh, podcasts are awesome because they're free, they're on demand, they're targeted. I can listen to what I want, where I want, when I want to. And I just clicked with that platform right away. I just was like, I love podcasting. I don't know why more people aren't obsessed with this. Like, why would you be in a car listening to like sports talk radio when you could be listening to like an amazing podcast on whatever you want to listen to, like whatever you want. And I just said, I need to be, I need to find a way to get involved with this medium. I planted a seed, which eventually led me to launch Entrepreneurs on Fire, which was the first daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. It was the first show that was seven days a week interviewing successful entrepreneurs. So I like to say, Stefan, that the day I launched, it was the best daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. I have to be honest and say it was also the worst because it was the only daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. And that uniqueness, like that blue ocean that I was able to acquire within the daily podcast world of uh, interviewing entrepreneurs led me to get some initial momentum and traction and authority and influence. And I just never let it go, brother. Like I, I just kept podcasting and I did 2000, <clears throat> excuse me, 2000 episodes in 2000 days which is, you know, quite a stretch. And as you and I are talking now, like you mentioned, I've done over 3000 interviews of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, over a hundred million listens of my podcast to date, getting over a million listens of the show every single month. And it's my, you know, passion project. It's like what I do. It's my business. It's something that I've been able to turn into a great financial um, machine as well. We just actually cross our 91st month in a row where our net profit has been over $100,000. So for 91 months in a row, which we publish our monthly income reports, 
we've done over $100,000 net profit. So wow. it's been quite the journey, a lot of ups, definitely some downs. Um, one of the highlights was getting to hang out with Stefan in Fiji uh, actually the year before last when we snuck it right under the COVID um, flag there and got to hang out in Fiji and have a blast. It's incredible, man. That's amazing what you've done and especially doing that many episodes, that's unheard of. So that's, that's incredible. So I want to, I want to hear from you after interviewing over 3000 incredible entrepreneurs. Do you mind sharing some of the people that you've interviewed that people listening or watching to this right now might recognize? And what would you say, who would you say have been some of the most impressive ones that you've interviewed and some of the key lessons that you've learned from them? I've learned so much. I mean, I literally look at every one of those episodes where I'm interviewing somebody, like I'm a mentee, like sitting here, like learning from these amazing mentors. So when people are like, who's your mentor? I'm like, I've had over 3000, like, let's take your pick. I mean, like I've learned from every single one of my guests and I've loved every interaction with them, been able to build, you know, friendships and, you know, grow my network and do so many amazing things as a result of these conversations. But also, you know, and just as importantly, like give Fire Nation, my audience, the ability to be those mentees as well. Like, like I am learning from these amazing mentors. And so to your question, I mean, let's, let's go through it. I mean, I've interviewed everybody at this point. I mean, if you are an entrepreneur who is on fire, you've been on my show. I mean, I've interviewed Tony Robbins. I've interviewed Barbara Corcoran, Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk, Brian Tracy, Jack Canfield. I mean, just like such a slew of people who are just so inspiring on so many levels. And it's been surreal a lot of times because I've been able to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Like a great example would be Tim Ferriss. I'd be like, wow, oh, I, was, I was reading his book, The 4-Hour Workweek, and it really opened my mind up to like how you can be an online entrepreneur and how you can market your business and travel and explore the world. And now this guy's like, having a conversation with me. And after the, after the the conversation, he's like, Hey John, so by the way, before we go, um, do you think you could, you could give me some mentorship with podcasting? I think I'm going to give a podcast to try. So wow. now I'm like mentoring Tim Ferriss and how to launch a podcast. You know, he since of course went and launched a podcast, which, you know, crushed the world and did amazing things and still doing amazing things. But like those scenarios all happen as a result of this really terrible me, podcaster, me, who was just like, I'm just going to do a daily show, put in the reps, get a little bit better every single day, surround myself with the right people and, you know, have my average improve because you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with Jim Rohn and step by step, day by day, get a little bit better, get a little more authority, a little more influence in this world. And so, you know, here we are now a decade into this podcasting journey and the 3,000 interviews, you know, I've been able to really learn so much from, which of course we can get into some great detail on here. Yeah, no, I'd love to hear what are some of those key things that you've learned? What are some of the, you know, core ingredients or commonalities that you found amongst all of these entrepreneurs? Three commonalities have always risen to the top. And like once I've, I identified this about four years ago, um, these three commonalities, it's crazy because every time I interview somebody new, ever since I made that like specific realization, they always come up. They always come up in these interviews and I'm like, oh, it's so true. So number one, the successful entrepreneurs that I've interviewed, they are productive individuals. Now, unfortunately, a lot of people think they're productive and they're just busy. So I like to get specific when I say, what does it mean to be productive? Here's the definition. You are producing the right content. Let me rephrase that. You are producing the right content. If you are being productive, you're producing the right content, whether that be what Steph and I are doing right now via this interview or a blog post or social media. It's you producing the right content, which preferably, by the way, is a real solution to your audience's real problems. If you're doing that, you are being productive. If you're doing what 99% of people do every single day, you're just being busy and you're not being productive. And then it's no shocker why you're not having the type of success you want. Number two, discipline. You have to be disciplined. This comes from my time in the military. I applied it day one, which allowed me to do the first ever daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs and actually execute on that discipline. But I've seen it across the board with all successful entrepreneurs. Discipline means that you are a disciple to a plan of action. So you're actually getting up in the morning with shocker, a plan of action. Like, wow, I know that's hard for a lot of people to understand that like that can, that can be a possibility that you don't have to wake up in the morning, have no idea what's going to happen that day and just open your inbox or open your social media and let OPP, other people's problems, dictate your entire day. 
That's what most people are doing. That's why most people are losing. The people that win, the people that I interview, the entrepreneurs on fire, they are disciples to a plan of action and they're doing the right things within that plan. Third and last thing, we focus. Successful entrepreneurs have the ability to focus. That's an acronym for follow one course until success. If you can focus, you will win. If you try to be that person that goes a mile wide with all these ideas and just one inch deep, you're making no impact. Those who focus go one inch wide, one mile deep. And guess what? They become the best at that one thing. And surprise, surprise, people want the best. They don't want the second best, the 10th best, the 100th best solution. They want the best. So although I was a terrible podcaster back in 2012 when I started, I was the best. I was also the worst. I was the only. So you can use that strategy. I focused on that one course, my daily podcast until success. And those are the three things, Stefan. It's amazing. And you also have to stick with it, you know, stick with it for a period of time, because I think a lot of people, they give up too soon and, and they just judge it as a failure, you know, and most things that I found don't really happen the way you initially expect, because I'm sure when you first thought of creating your podcast, you thought, oh, it'd be easy. I'm going to get all these followers, but the rude awakening in reality is that, you know, you're consistently putting out content, you're consistently taking action, following that plan. And you don't see the results right away, but you have to keep with it. And then over time, you built your podcast to where it is. And I think that's another key thing is just sticking with something long enough to actually have success with it. I mean, a lot of people do say this is that ignorance is bliss. And, you know, a lot of us maybe would have thought twice about starting whatever it is that we did if we had known how much work and pain and struggle and, you know, strife it was going to be. Of course, I have no regrets. You know, it's, it's allowed me. To, to build the exact business that, you know, I now love and, and want to be running. But yeah, I mean, when you first talk, you're like, oh yeah, I'll just interview a person a day. And like, that'll be nice. And that'll be fun. And da, da, da. And there's a lot more to that. There's so much more to that. But I will say um, to your point is that my mentor and accountability part, um, sorry, leader, um, Cliff Ravenscraft and Jamie Masters, she was my mentor. He was my uh, accountability um, leader of a uh, our accountability group, the mastermind that he was running for podcasts, they both were top in the industry. They said, do not do a daily podcast. You will fail. They were very emphatic about it. And I said something to myself that I think could really help a lot of people that, you know, frankly, just listen to too many other people's opinions too often. And that is, I said, if the top people in the industry are telling me it can't be done and I figure out a way to do it, think of the opportunity there is there. And so that's actually excited and propelled me forward where I think a lot of people would have taken that advice and been like, oh man, well, I guess I got to come up with another idea. Well, maybe the idea is actually within that advice and that could be something to think about. Yes, it seems like you had, you believed in your vision. You had such a strong belief and confidence and certainty in your vision that even other people's uncertainty and doubt you didn't allow that, the external factors to influence your internal confidence in your vision. I think that's something that you need because everybody that's building their business or embarking on this journey of entrepreneurship, they have other people, whether that's their friends or their family members. I remember for me, everybody in my life thought I was crazy to start an online business. That's a scam. You can't make any money from that. And, you know, I still sometimes see this and hear this today, but, you know, if I were to listen to them of just, Hey, go to school, get a job you know, live that kind of life, I wouldn't be where I am today. And you wouldn't either. So there is a level of you just have to believe so much in what you're going to do. And just not, you know, just kind of the naysayers just put your blinders on and focus on that. And I think you got to think about the reality of the world as well. I again, I said it now three times, let me say it again, like I knew I was going to be a bad podcaster. Of course I was I'd never done it before. How was I going to be good at something I've never done? And was I really going to get good at podcasting, doing what everybody else was doing, which was a once a week show, doing four interviews per week, doing 50 episodes a year? How does anybody get good doing something like you can't? Not when I'm starting from scratch. So I was like, how do I get good at something? Well, how do, have I ever gotten good at anything in my life? I've put in the reps. I put in the work. And every day I got just a little bit better and guess what? By a year and a half, I had done 480 episodes. And if I had stuck to the other plan, I would have been at like 70. I mean, that's yeah. such a game changer that that propelled me to new heights. I love it. 
let's talk, I want to talk to you about a little bit about motivation. Um, what would you say drives a lot of these entrepreneurs? What's their drive, their motivation? I think oftentimes maybe when someone's first getting started, maybe it's, you know, you're broken, you're struggling and you're trying to get yourself out of a bad situation. Um, other people might be more driven by the passion of what they're doing. And it seems like that might be more what drives entrepreneurs because a lot of the people that you're interviewing, they have all the money they need. It's not really about the money at that stage, but do you mind just kind of sharing a little bit of what you've identified, what drives these people, what drives a Tony Robbins, a Barbara, Barbara Corcoran, a Tim Ferriss, people that they're always kind of looking for that cutting edge. They're always growing. They're always doing more and more and more. And everyone else looks at them like, oh my gosh, how are they doing that? It's amazing. They're inspired by that ambition that they have. So I interviewed somebody back in 2015. I was in my third year of Entrepreneurs on Fire at that point. And I was in also my third year of um, making over seven figures of revenue with the business. So financially, I was a massive success. And then this individual said something that made me realize that why I maybe wasn't feeling 100% fulfilled with what I was doing. And that quote was, you got to figure out a way to go from success to significance. And that was something I had to cope with because I was like, okay, I've achieved the success that I thought that I wanted. Like, what's next? And what's next for me was going into significance. And that's those people that you mentioned, the Tony Robbins, the Barbara Corkins of the world, like they're going into that place of significance. Like they've done it, you know, financially, they're set. I mean, you know, barring some super hyperinflation situation that's going to, you know, put us all back at zero, which, you know, who knows. But I mean, you know, listen, they're going for significance in this world. And like, that's where really I've been now for the last six years. And that's ever since that 2015 quarter is like, what is it going to look like for me to live in this world of significance? And I think that that's a big, powerful challenge to people and something that I think would be very helpful for your viewers, Stefan, because I think you and I are actually pretty connected on this level, is that a lot of people, when you ask them, like, what do you really working for? Like, like, what is your, your goal? And there's like, well, I just want, you know, to make more money. Well, I get it because money allows you to get to that basic level of comfort and, you know, support and you know, loved ones, et cetera. So I get that answer, but I'm like, okay, but like, what's like, how much money do you want to make? And like, they always kind of give some basic answer of, you know, more. And if you just only have that answer of like more, it's always going to be more. And so when does that more stop? And for, unfortunately, some people, more never stops and until it's too late. And for some of us, and I put you in this category as well from what I know about you, is we actually get to a point where we're like, no, it's not more. In fact, it's enough. And so like I've cultivated my lifestyle now where I'm living down here in Puerto Rico on a beautiful Caribbean island. I work hard five days per month. And then the other 25 days, I'm working on my health, my wellness, my relationships, um, playing pickleball. I'm doing like exploring. Kate and I are typically doing 75 to 90 days a year, traveling somewhere in the world. Like we prioritize other things. And yet our business, you know, could have potentially hit $10 million last year if we sat down and just did nothing but 30 days of hard work. But the fact that we did five days, you know, kept us, you know, at our typical, you know, two to $3 million per year. And for people that'll be like, why aren't you wanting to grow your business? Cause I'm like, we have enough. Like we are enough. Like I don't want to stop making money. I want to keep making money, but I've got to my lifestyle right now where I have, you know, three virtual assistants in the Philippines, their salaries combined are under $4,000. This is myself and Kate. And I work really hard five days per month. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. Like to run this entrepreneur, entrepreneurs on fire podcast, I've got to work hard five days per month but I got 25 days per month where I am able to just focus on other things, do what I want. And that's my version, Stefan, of uncommon success. That is my version of financial freedom and fulfillment. And I, unlike so many people, actually know what that looks like because I've sat down and I've actually created that and I've actually gotten detailed and I understand what that looks like. And that's just a step that so many people have never taken. I don't care if you're talking about you know, CEOs of companies that are making, you know, tens of hundreds of millions of dollars all the way down to somebody who just, you know, cracked their first five figures in their business. They don't know that. And so they're just like this listless boat drifting without even any destination in mind. And it's never enough. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. And I see that is a very common pitfall of a lot of entrepreneurs 
where as you're becoming an entrepreneur, there's so much opportunity. There's so much more that you can have that's available for you. Opportunities that when you're first starting, you wish that you would have had. And I, I've experienced a lot of burnout. I've experienced times of just so much stress and, and challenges from that, that I got to a point where I wasn't really living my life on my terms. I was living my life on everyone else's terms. And I just mm. kept chasing more and more and more instead of really redefining, redefining what do I really want? Because, you know, I remember for me, when I read the four hour work week, that was my goal. And one of the reasons that I had in building my online business, oh my gosh, I can work four hours a week. That wasn't really the reality of it though. Um, but by taking that step back to really define what do I want? What's the lifestyle that I want has been key. And you are, one thing I love about you, you are a lifestyle entrepreneur. Um, you've kind of identified what kind of lifestyle that you want to live and you're living it. And there's a lot of entrepreneurs that I'm not envious of. They might have more money than me. They might have more fame. They might be, you know, making more of an impact, but I see their lifestyle. And one thing that- I wouldn't um, trade spots with them for a second. Yeah. And you know, one thing that Tony Robbins says, I, I know you know this, is success without fulfillment is failure. Mm. And a lot of them, they just keep chasing more and more success. But meanwhile, their health is deteriorating. Their relationship or their marriage or relationship with their kids is not going well. Um, you know, there's their mental health challenges. There's a lot of those components that I think come up. And um, I'd love to hear just, you know, about how you've created your lifestyle and how you got to that point where you decided this is enough for me. So I was really looking around in about the 2014 timeframe, um, right before that, you know, interview that I had in 2015 about going from success to significance. And I was living in San Diego and I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And, you know, I loved the lifestyle. It was great entrepreneurial community there. Everything was working out really well. And I was making millions of dollars a year in net profits. And I started getting these tax bills for a million plus dollars. I was writing seven figure checks to the government. And I did that in 13, 14, 15. And I just like was like at this place, I'm like, man, I am literally working for the government until June 15th of every single year. And then finally, at the end of June, June 16th, I'm actually starting to you know be able to make money that goes to me. I'm like, that's a long time to be working for somebody else as a quote unquote entrepreneur. <laughs> you know, I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs think about it that way, but like you're actually working for the government for as long as it takes you to pay off your taxes. Um, so I started to kind of try to figure some things out and say, you know, hey, do I like just need to scale this and just go bigger and just like get a bigger team and make so much more revenue that like, you know, now I'm still paying, I'm gonna be paying more and more and more in taxes, but you know, I'll be having more and more and more revenue as well. So, I mean, maybe I'll finally be able to get to that, you know, whatever, you know, number is that I hadn't yet sat down to create. So for me at that point, it was just potentially, do I just do more? And that's when I, you know, started looking around and learning from other people and some digital nomads and, and seeing the different lifestyles that were available. And I stumbled across the opportunity of Puerto Rico of moving to this American territory. So you're still like, you know, in the United States and you're still an American citizen and, you know, you don't even need a passport to come here. Like you just literally can jump on a plane and fly to San Juan. And if you move your business here and live here at least six months of the year, you pay a flat 4% corporate tax rates. No federal, no states, 4%. And I said, so I can move and literally give myself a 47% raise the day that I move because I was paying 51% in Cali, 4% in Puerto Rico. And I said, man, if I'm able to do that, like that just changes the game. Now I'm keeping almost all the money that I'm making. And frankly, like, I can really start to live that lifestyle that I want, not like having bigger and bigger teams, bigger ad spends, bigger this, bigger tax bills, meetings every day with different department heads. Like that wasn't why I got into this. Like that wasn't why I decided to become an entrepreneur. Like I became the entrepreneur because again, I really had in mind something along the lines of that. Hey, let's work hard, you know, five, seven, 10 days a month. But I want more days than not as days that I can do whatever I want to do. And again, I didn't, you know, start back in 14, 15, 16, or 2017, like just working five hard days a month. Like I had to put in a lot more work. That was a different season of my business. The season I'm in now is the one I'm talking about where I work five days a month real hard. And then the other 25 days are in cruise control. A little bit of email here, a little bit of social media there. But for the most part, 
cruise control. It took me a decade, you know, almost to get here. Um, so like that though, that for me though, was it all coming down to sitting down and actually defining like what was important to me. And what was important to me was not writing seven figure checks to the government, but, you know, being a small, lean, profit-making machine working when I wanted to on what I wanted to, and that being the focus. And that's when I just took control of my life and said, you know, what's that, uh, that Brian Tracy quote is like, you're not a tree. You can move like literally. And I said, I'm going to move. Peace. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And just having that flexibility that your business provides you and, um, yeah, I mean, just, I, I love that. I, I, I can relate to that because I've gone through a similar journey myself, moving to Panama and making that decision for a better quality of lifestyle and it makes all the difference. And, you know, you've shared with me how much you love it there. And there's a great digital nomad community there. And just your quality of life is so much better than it would otherwise be in something like California. So, um, and it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's not how much money you make, it's how much you keep. And so actually measuring your success and, and your progress based on what you're actually keeping, what you're netting, and what you're able to, you know, save or invest or live off of is the, the key thing. Um, I want to transition now to talking about your book. So you decided to write a book. Um, you shared with me, it was a huge process for you. Uh, the book is called The Common Path to Uncommon Success. You want to share with people why you decided to write this book and what is the core message that you want to share with people? So when I kind of, you know, came up for air after like my season of working really hard, I was like, okay, like, you know, now I'm starting to really design the lifestyle that I want, you know, like working hard a handful of days a month, you know, working on my health, my wellness, having some fun relationships, traveling. Like I really had all these things dialed in. I was like, man, I've now interviewed over 3000 successful entrepreneurs. I've learned so much. And by the way, I've taken their learnings. I've applied it to my business which has had 91 months in a row of a net profit of over $100,000. And we publish our monthly income reports, you know, over on our website where we bring in our, a lawyer to share a legal tip. Our accountant comes in and shares a tax tip and just adds a lot of value to these income reports. So like, I knew that like our business was doing a lot of great things. And I knew a lot of that was as a result of those interviews I was doing with the world's most successful entrepreneurs, learning from them, applying it to my business, and really understanding what made a successful entrepreneur uncommonly successful. Like not just successful, but like an entrepreneur on fire, like uncommonly successful. And so I sat down, this is towards the end of 2019, pretty soon after we got back from Fiji actually. And I just started writing down all the similarities and all the commonalities that successful entrepreneurs possess. And when I boiled it down and I, cut out the fat and I combined the similar ones. I was looking down, Stefan, at 17 core foundational principles. Tried to make it 18 to make it an even number. It just, again, the number was 17. It was 17 core foundational principles that I identified makes up a successful entrepreneur. And I look back again over the decade and 3,000 entrepreneurs I've interviewed, and I said, every single entrepreneur that I've interviewed has gone on this path, has taken this journey, has these foundational principles within their life and their business. So I looked down, kind of being the military guy that I am, and I said, this is a roadmap. This is absolutely a roadmap. I put them chronologically and I created the 17-step roadmap to financial freedom and fulfillment. And I said, well, I'm not an author per se, I've never written a book before, but this is 17 chapters staring back at me. This right here is a book that needs to be written. So I got an agent, went the traditional publishing route, got HarperCollins to, uh, you know, spot me a $350,000 advance. You know, then I sat down and in 2020, while we were all quarantines, I got to work. And, you know, my version of work, again, was the first two hours of every single day were dedicated to writing this book, the first two hours. And it took me eight months in 480 writing hours to write this book, to expound upon those 17 chapters properly. And um, I'm so proud of the final result here. Like not only did I, you know, write these 17 steps, the 17 chapters here, 
But I sat down and for every single step in this journey, I asked myself, of the 3,000 people I've interviewed, who best exemplifies this specific step, this specific step, this specific step? And I reached out to them and they contributed an amazing section to that step in their area of genius, in their zone of fire. And so this book has obviously everything that I've learned over the years from these 3,000 successful, successful entrepreneurs, but also a great contribution from these 17 all-star entrepreneurs. And Stefan, you know them all. I mean, it's Amy Porterfield, Russell Brunson, Jeff Walker, Stu McLaren, Pat Flynn, um, Hal Elrod. I mean, just unbelievable entrepreneurs across the board. And they contributed to make this book really the special uh, book project that it is. And so- you know, we did the whole traditional publishing route. So I had the right editor, the publishing team, the book marketing team, and we're just going all out on this thing. Like, you know, I am just so proud of this book. This is like, in a way, what I consider like my gift back to my audience um, for all the support they've given me over the years, you know, allowing me to run this entrepreneursonfire.com media empire. Like, you know, this business, <clears throat> you know, this generated over $20 million in the past nine plus years. And so when I get hundreds of emails a week from my audience asking essentially a variation of 10 questions, I can't you know, an answer those emails individually. It's impossible time-wise. But now I can literally say, this is the answer to your question. This book is your 17-step roadmap to financial freedom and fulfillment. So if you want your version of Uncommon Success, the common path to uncommon success is for you. I love it. So I'm going to throw a link below for you guys. Um, the, the website is uncommonsuccessbook.com, but also throw a link on Amazon for you guys to check it out. What are some of the steps? What would you say are some of the, the, the most important ones or some of your personal favorite ones from the book? So let's just start with step one and step two real quick. And I'll kind of buzz through these, but um, like this is a sad truth. And, and I've recognized this, you know, being an entrepreneur in the space for over 10 years is, listen, so many people are going to die. And I mean, leave this earth, never even knowing what their big idea was. Like it's there inside them, but it will stay inside you unless you actually sit down and intentionally understand and decide to bring that big idea out into the world. And then when you do, you're able to live in what I call the zone of fire. You're waking up every single day doing what you should do, where you should do it, with whom you should do it with. And so that's what step one is. It's identifying your big idea. Like I literally teach you how to do that for probably the first time in your life. Or for some of you who think you have your big idea, there's some awesome ways that you can really validate that and maybe make some tweaks and adjustments you haven't thought about to really slam that home. And then here's a problem. And this happens so much in our, in our industry, Stefan. You have your big idea, you think you're off to the races, but guess what? That's step one of 17 for a reason. There's 16 more steps. Your big idea is a really great idea. Other people have had that idea as well. It's a big world out there. That's entrenched competition that will slaughter you like the lamb that you are if you just wander out with this big idea, this big, broad, vague idea that you have. That's why step two is discover your niche. What that means is find a void within your big idea that's not being met. Find a problem that's not being solved within your big idea. One problem that you can become the best solution to. That's how you're going to get initial traction, initial momentum. That's how you're going to get the ball rolling, which is so hard to do. Like real quick, Stefan, back in 2012, my big idea was a podcast. Awesome. Thousands of them. Okay. I niched down to a business podcast. Awesome. There were hundreds of them. I niched down a third time into interview business podcasts. Okay. There were seven. Did I want to be the eighth best interview business podcast out there? No, I wanted to be the best. So I niched down a fourth time to a daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. And as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, I was the best day one. I was the worst day one. I was the only day one. And if I can leave your viewers with something, you need to remember like the higher the barrier, the lower the competition. And I set a barrier so high with a daily podcast, the competition wasn't even low. It just didn't exist. And so that's step two. I teach you how to discover your niche and really own that to get initial traction. Um, the last thing I'll say about the steps, we'll skip ahead to step seven because this is the beast of the, of the seven steps. Just this one step is 13,500 words. Creating a content production plan. 
Now, this may hurt some of your feelings, but I hope you have thicker skin than this. Your content production plan likely sucks. And I mean that sincerely. Guess what? Stefan's content production plan, it used to suck. Mine used to suck. The reason why we're such prolific producers of content is because we fixed it, we improved it, and now our content production plans are fantastic. And guess what? Mine used to be terrible. Now it's fantastic. Yours, which is probably terrible right now, can be fantastic. 13,500 words I wrote to help you get it fantastic. It, is a, it could be a business book in and of itself, creating a content production plan. You're looking at a guy that's produced over 3,000 episodes, you know, countless other pieces of content on all of the other platforms. Like Most people's heads would pop off on what I do. And again, I do all of that five days of hard work per month. And that's all because of my content production plan, which did not start day one, but I'm here now and I'm going to teach you every part of that process. So those are just three of my favorite steps. And, you know, Stefan, really wanting people to just, you know, your, your, your audience is action takers. So I really want them to pre-order this book. I mean, pre-orders are everything for the launch. So you want to check out that URL that Stefan shared. You're going to see endorsements from Gary Vaynerchuk, personal endorsements, Seth Godin, Neil Patel, Eric and Mandy, Dory Clark. You're going to get the first chapter of the book. I give it away to you right there. So you can read it, see my writing style, see if it's for you. Um, there's a video of me there explaining more details about the book. But the most important thing for a lot of people is I actually have all five of my bonuses for pre-orders listed out there. And just one of them, Stefan, this for you being a financial guy, man, I am shipping all three of my journals, all three of them on my own dime to your doorstep. I am literally paying to ship all these journals to everybody's doorstep who is just pre-ordering one of these books, just one of them. Those are for people in the USA. If you're outside the USA, I'm emailing you the beautiful digital packs immediately, which you can use. They're fillable. They're gorgeous. That's just one bonus. There's four other insane bonuses. I won't tell you about now. You have to read about them. Uncommonsuccessbook.com. I love it, man. Well, I love just her mission and just wanting to share this with so many people. And I endorse it. It's a fantastic book. I've gone through part of it and uh, love it. So I want to encourage you guys to go and pre-order your copy of Uncommon at UncommonSuccessBook.com. The book is The Common Path to Uncommon Success. You can find it on Amazon as well. John, thank you so much for your time, brother. Always appreciate it. Is there any last message, a word of inspiration? Because one thing I want to mention too, if you guys follow John on Instagram, he posts these, what is it, one minute or so clips yeah, of this quick. motivation. So is there something that you can share maybe over the last week or so as a piece of motivation that you have for my audience? So what I do want to share is actually the piece of content, um, specifically the quote that changed everything for me back in 2012. I read this quote by Albert Einstein and it shifted my entire life's journey. Try not to become a person of success, but rather a person of value. And I'd look in the mirror, Stefan, and realize that I was just chasing success. I wasn't providing any value into the world. I committed to changing that, which ended up becoming my podcast three months later. It didn't happen immediately. The idea didn't come right away, but it, seed was planted. Podcast was launched three months later. And for the first time in my life, I became a person of value. And did that translate to dollars right away? No, I made $27,000 the first year of, of doing a daily podcast. So not a huge ROI. Not terrible, but... Then things changed. Month 13 was my first $100,000 month. And I haven't had a month under 100K net profit 91 months in a row, all because I became a person of value. So that's what I want to leave your viewers with. How can you become a person of value? And if you already are doing it in some ways, how can you take it to the next level? Add more value. All right. Appreciate it, brother. Thank you guys so much. And if those of you that are watching this enjoyed it, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Leave a comment below with something that really stood out for you based on this interview. Subscribe for more. Check out John's book and his website and his podcast. And we'll see you again in another episode. Take care.